All right, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Tim Cady. I am one of the uh, co-leaders of the uh, North Texas User Group. Um, so I'll be moderating the event today, uh, but we have a lot of folks on the call. We have a lot of cool stuff planned uh, for this afternoon. Uh, but before we get into all that, we're going to do a couple quick uh, housekeeping items um, to start off with. Uh, first, if you have questions uh, throughout the event, um, we'd ask that you put those in the Q&A. Uh, they're a little bit easier for us to manage for our panelists to answer those questions efficiently if they're in the Q&A as opposed to the just general chat area. First thing, um, kind of who we are, I want to give a quick shout out to all the folks that helped put this event together. Uh, leading user group at times uh, can be challenging, whether in person or uh, virtual events. So shout out to all these folks um, who kind of uh, make these things happen. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, we're not going to do kind of individual introductions, uh, but all these are on our panelists uh, call at the moment. So uh, if you have questions, like I said, feel free to pop, pop them in the Q&A. Or if you want to chat with any of us after the event, we're all on LinkedIn, we're all on Twitter and Tableau Public, so feel free to connect with us on there. Um, I just want to talk about kind of why communities like this exist. Um, and I'm going to bring in Joey Ramos, who is also the co-lead for the North Texas User Group, to talk through this slide. Um, for those of you that uh, are part of the North Texas Group, this will look familiar. Uh, this might be new to some of the Boston folks, but um, we share this every meeting kind of as a reminder uh, that the user group's really about you. Uh, we're just here to kind of uh, administer and organize. Uh, the first point, the first pillar we like to talk about is collaboration. Um, to us, that's really the backbone of the Tableau community, sharing ideas, um, sharing new techniques and tips and these sort of things um, is really what this is all about. Uh, Joey, you want to? Yeah, so definitely just to sort of uh, reiterate uh, what Tim just said is <clears throat> there are a lot of great tools, self-service analytic tools, data wrangling, data transformation, um, you know, data visualization, but there's nothing like the Tableau community and the willingness of the community to collaborate and to network. And so our goal here, at, you know, for our user group is, is Definitely to collaborate, network, you know, I, we promise at every meeting you attend, we'll try to teach you something new. So if you do learn something, uh, make sure to go back and spread the word uh, within your organization to your colle colleagues. <clears throat> and also, most importantly, uh, have fun. You know, uh, if you've ever been to a Tableau conference, unfortunately this year, of course, uh, with everything going on, we won't have one. but. If you've ever been, it's just a celebration of individuals that are extremely passionate about data. And it's all about the celebration of data. And so that's one of the, the good things about this community is, you know, we're here to have fun, so. Absolutely. And kind of our final point there is, um, this is your community. Like I mentioned earlier, we're here to organize. Uh, we're here to kind of uh, pull these things together, but. We'd love to hear your feedback. If there's something you want to see more of or less of, we'd love to know that. So your feedback matters and uh, feel free to reach out to us with that. All right, a um, couple more things before we kind of get into why we're all here today. Um, Tableau Ambassador nominations are now open. Um, so if you have someone in your network, in your circle that uh, helps lead, um, empower, enable, um, this might be a good way to kind of recognize those folks. There are, I believe, five different categories um, for Tableau ambassadors. Let me scroll down here. Um, right, so there's social media ambassadors, user group ambassadors, forum, uh, Tableau public, student ambassadors, and they've added a new one this year, um, the data dev ambassador. So if you know anyone that falls into this group, um, like I said, the ambassador nominations is a great way to recognize their efforts and their work. Also, I kind of want to make note of uh, Tableau Live that's happening June 30th. So this is sort of Tableau's answer to the lack of, you know, Tableau conferences this year, as Joey mentioned. Um, this event will be the 30th. It is um, on London time, I believe. I'll have to double check on that. But uh, this will give us a good idea of what conferences are going to look like stateside. So feel free, feel free to go register for this event. 
Um, I registered this morning. It looks like it should be a lot of fun. With that, I'm going to kind of jump in today's agenda. Um, here are some of the things we're going to go through today. Uh, so in North Texas, we like to do uh, something called Community Spotlight. Or we pick out a member of our group and kind of showcase some of their work, um, some of their inspiration for that work. Um, today, that's going to be uh, Brandy Carpenter. She's going to be joining us from the North Texas group to talk about uh, a vis she created um, and kind of what led her to create that. After that, uh, Brian Moore, uh, the, uh, one of the co-leads from the Boston group, is going to uh, share with us a presentation he put together uh, about building better dashboards through interactivity. Uh, I believe Brian shared this on VizConnect uh, a couple weeks back, but I wasn't able to catch it, so I'm excited to, uh, excited to see this today. Uh, then we're going to take a couple minutes. We're going to do some trivia. Uh, we're going to be giving away some Tableau swag for those that uh, place top three in that fun little trivia game. Um, and then from there, we're going to move on to uh, Zen Master Ken Fleurlage. He's going to share with us uh, Tableau's new data model functionality. Um, pretty interesting. It came out in uh, version 2020.2, so it's very new. Um, and it's going to change the way you connect to your data, and you're going to and change the way you're going to work with your data sources. Uh, so this will be uh, great for, for those of you that are upgrading soon. Finally, we're going to wrap up with Kate. Uh, she's going to introduce a new Viz contest for the folks in Boston, and uh, she'll close us out from there. With that, uh, we're now going to jump into the community spotlight with Brandy. So I'm going to bring Joey back in. I'm going to introduce Brandy. Uh, she's an exploratory analytics consultant at Allstate. So Brandy, do you want to kind of jump in and uh, share your screen here? Perfect. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, thanks so for being here. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you that want to follow Brandy, check out her work. Uh, we have her Tableau Public profile up there, and uh, she's on Twitter as well, at uh, carpenter.brandy. Is that right? Um, I think it's just Carpenter Brandy on Twitter. OK, no doubt. All right. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and share your screen if you're not already. Okay. Yep, I can see your screen. Perfect. All right, Brandy. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Thanks for stepping up and uh, you know participating in our community spotlight. Um, I've seen your biz. Uh, I'm really impressed with it. So why don't you go ahead and start by telling us uh, a little bit about it and sort of about what your inspiration was. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> so Prestonwood Pregnancy Center is a Christian nonprofit organization uh, that's uh, here in the DFW area. Um, it's an organization that my church partners with. Um, they assist with unplanned and crisis pregnancies. So they offer um, free pregnancy tests, free sonograms, and just kind of classes to uh, help those who just kind of need a little bit more information and assistance. So it's really just all about supporting women and couples uh, just during an uncertain time in their lives. <clears throat> As far as how, uh, what inspired the Viz, I actually received this mailer at home. And so um, you can see on the top left is kind of like the front page over in the bottom is the inside and in the top right is the back page. So really this is just kind of a review of their 2019 results and just kind of how everything went just to kind of keep the community informed. Um, and so really my goal eventually um, is just this is an organization that's close to my heart and so I hope to kind of volunteer with them maybe more in the future or just kind of any other organization any other nonprofits that need some help with data analysis very cool absolutely so it looks like there's a small sort of cross tab or pivot table on the bottom there is that where you collected the data from yep that's exactly right so over here on the left um, there's some numbers that I used as the bands on the dashboard. On the right, there's that cross tab. And so actually, there's kind of a zoomed in look at that. And so this is just straight from their mailer, and then I just plugged everything into Excel. So real quick, if uh, what does bands stand for? <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a few uh, definitions. The one I know is the S numbers. There you go. I just wanted to hear you say it. 
PC version yeah. is big aggregated numbers. Ah, there, there thank you. you. Go. <laughs> right. Never trust me to be PCs. <laughs> uh, was that Dustin? Thanks, Dustin. That was awesome. Yeah, it's a it's a consultant special. There you go. <laughs> I'll steal that from you. <laughs> yeah. So very cool. No. So um, yeah. So why don't you go ahead next and and tell us a little bit about the biz, and tell us a little bit about like what's what's the story behind the biz. Sure. Um, so really this top portion is more of like um, an infographic feel. And so I just really wanted to kind of introduce people to who PPC is, what they do, um, how they support the community, and then just over here to the right, you know, just kind of show where you can find them. And then here, um, kind of like a little, an Easter egg in plain sight, if you will, um, their mobile clinic. So they actually have little buses that look exactly like this. And so they'll just kind of go around downtown. And so here you can just kind of click to go be taking the website to see the uh, location and the hours. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, if you scroll down, keeping in tune with the mailer that I received, uh, this is just going into the 2019 results. And so this section of the bands um, just kind of shows how they impacted the community in 2019 with an emphasis on their, um, the biggest achievement, which was 91% of their clients in choosing life for their babies. And so that's the, um, their, you know, their whole initiative. And um, going down a bit further, just wanted to kind of iterate um, the, the progress that they've made. And so they've been around a little while, but these are the only uh, data points that were shown on that flyer you guys saw. But you can just really see uh, over the years, you know, initially it started with this location up in Richardson, which is just a northern suburb of Dallas. And then in the past um, few years, they've opened up the secondary location and then expanded their mobile clinic outreach. So um, over here on the left is are the bar charts. And so you can just kind of zero in and you know filter the chart to the right to get more granular view of the monthly trend. Um, but it just really emphasizes, you know, from 2014 to 2019, you're seeing four and a half times plus, you know, the amount of clients <clears throat> from 2014 and a 73.1% increase from 2018. So making a very, big, very great impact in the community. Excellent, yeah, this is great. Um, I do have a question about, uh, about your map there. I've seen that technique used a couple times. Um, I'm curious about how you kind of layered it together and how you kind of made that work there. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually this one, a colleague of mine uh, pointed me out to, or pointed out Lindsay Betsendahl's, um, she's got, I believe it's about Africa. She's got a viz, I'm not sure the exact details of it anymore. It's been a while, but uh, it really inspired this kind of circular cutout. And so um, there's actually a lot of details that go into this one. And so there's over here, I kind of spelled out a little bit more clearly. So there's, it's kind of all behind the scenes and tucked away, but um, you know, the first layer in the background is just a map that you know, you can really create uh, with some uh, probably some adjustments made in Mapbox, um, and then on top of that, to get that circular border, is just this shape cut out. You can see kind of this section that was actually made in PowerPoint, um, and then brought in as an image and just overlaid, and just making sure that that middle is transparent, and then you've got the white border, and then you know, when the dashboard's got a white background, um, you don't have these dotted lines as the border. That was just for y'all's benefit today, but, um, you know, kind of fades into the background so you can actually see that transition on the main dashboard. And then on top of that, uh, I've got the PNG image of the mobile clinic. And um, that was, you know, one way to bring in an image is to, you know, add it to your custom shapes and bring in an icon. But when I tried to do that, it just made the image really blurry. And so I wanted to keep the high quality photo. So we brought in a PNG and just layered it on top. And then because of all the layering components in there, I don't want users to be accidentally clicking on different layers and highlighting different things. Um, so brought in a blank object, uh, number four right here that you can probably barely see. But that one's just a transparent overlay. And I'll kind of demo the purpose of that. This is a snippet from another dashboard I created at the end of last year before learning about this technique. Um, 
but you know the first the top view is how it's supposed to look and then the bottom view is what happens if your user accidentally clicks on a worksheet there and so it's just a way to kind of prevent that from happening and that way when you've got the blank object over it no matter how much someone clicks on the image it's not going to accidentally select and then that last layer i wanted to have that url activity on there for the um for the mobile clinic image only and so i just created a blank worksheet and added um, a custom image. It was just a transparent image onto that, on, onto that worksheet and then um, layered that worksheet just over the tiniest outline of the actual mobile clinic. And one kind of little note here is, you know, knowing what I know now, I could actually combine some of these steps using Figma or WXD and the um, trainings that Lovelytics and Chintilla Jagernoff has been doing lately, but this was, pre my knowledge of Figma, and so there were quite a few steps involved, but it, I think the end result was worth it. The whole theme here for me was just wanting to keep it elegant and um, just keep it as simple and clean as possible. Yeah, very cool. It's definitely clean. Very good. So <clears throat> we also uh, actually saw in the chat, um, which was one of my questions for you, is the bottom left rounded bar chart. Sure. Tell us a little bit about that and how you created it. Absolutely. And so let's jump right into it. Those are my notes, but we'll do an actual demo. So starting from a blank sheet, um, you just start with your measure. And so in my case, it was the number of client visits on two columns and, and grab your dimension, which in our case is going to be the visits and drag that to rows. And then now um, I've got calculation that's just equal to zero. You could also just type it in there directly, but I already had it in here from another worksheet. So you drag that onto columns as well. And then once you get in the view, you click that pill, drag it down and just hover over that axis of your initial measure. So number of clients in this case, until you see that those green rulers let go and that'll create a combined access chart. And then from here, I've learned the hard way the order does matter, otherwise you kind of get out of line and it goes crazy, but um, switch it from automatic to align on the marks card. And then in my case, measure names, um, whenever we did that combined chart, it pulls in measure names and throws up measure values on the columns. So instead of having measure names on color, I can drag it to path. And then from here, it's all about just getting your formatting. Um, usually the book would stop here. If you, so for example, in Superstar Data, if you were wanting to look at some of sales by category, this would, you know, this process would get you there. In my particular case, I actually needed this year to be continuous so that I could <clears throat> have it work with the area chart and be interactive. Problem is, as you can see, it creates a bit of a mess. So it took me a little bit to figure out, but remember that I needed to bring the visit onto, you can bring it to detail or to label. In my case, I used label. And then I hid the headers. Um, and then I just formatted the labeling so that it was loose centered. Yep, kind of all the way through. And then there's just kind of some formatting to play with until you get it to look right. And one thing I learned is it kind of looks different the worksheet than it does on the dashboard. So there's kind of some back and forth that you've got to do, but it's worth the end result, definitely. And you can just kind of remove the zero lines as well. So it's a nice clean biz. Yeah, it's definitely clean. Uh, it's definitely a very slick uh, technique that I'm going to be uh, using for now on. So thank you. Of course. Absolutely. Um, uh, anything else you wanted to kind of touch on or share about this viz before we, before we wrap up? Yeah, just a few other things that I thought were pretty special about this one. Um, one of the coolest things that I got to implement was an idea from Jeff Platner, was at least where I discovered it. If you go over here to the right and see that light bulb, you can click on it and have this nice overlay pop up. And that's really great because it just, it's a way to kind of declutter your dashboard instead of having, you know, like especially in business dashboards, sometimes you've got to put maybe more context clues than you would want. And so this is a good way to kind of declutter. You can just kind of, you know, throw it in here, lower the opacity of this image. Uh, so I just got a, a, white, a white box in there and with my text and my, actually did the text and the arrows in PowerPoint as well and just created an image 
but then you just make that white background in the lower to like 60 to 80 percent opacity just kind of whatever looks right and then that way your user can see the chart and kind of get those direct instructions so that was one of the very the cool tricks i learned that was a lot of fun and then the other um kind of coupled with that is the actual icon itself was one that i had a lot of fun creating and this um, can actually give a shout out to both ken and kevin flailers that um I just really hadn't given PowerPoint the proper credit that it deserves. And so this is actually all done in PowerPoint. The icon um, was one that I just found in there, you know, using their built-in image search. And then I just adjusted the coloring for my needs. And then I was able to add in that yellow background where it's kind of deeper, a deeper yellow in the light bulb itself. And then it kind of fades out there. So it has a nice light bulb glow, which I thought was really fun. Um, and then the last part that I'll kind of touch on is I don't know if it's anyone else or if it's just me and borderline OCD tendencies, but particularly with this dashboard, um, really wanted to keep it clean, like I mentioned. And one thing that drives me crazy is whenever my icons get that black outline effect. So you'll notice here, no matter how many times I click, I'm not getting the outline, but I am getting the tooltip, so it's still interactive. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but there's a few different ways to kind of work around that. This is the effect I was talking about. I don't like the black outline. But yeah, so there's some pros and cons to each of the methods that I know of, but I'll probably be touching on that in a, in a future training, so. Absolutely. Yeah, this visit looks great. Uh, thanks for sharing all those uh, techniques with us. Um, if anyone has questions for Brandy or, or curious about how some of these other things work on her viz, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to my screen if you don't mind. Perfect, thank you. And uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if you're looking to follow Brandy, uh, there's her public profile and her Twitter. Uh, thanks, Brandy. Um, I appreciate thanks, uh, Brandy. sharing that with the group. Yep, thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, uh, so we're gonna move on now to, uh, oh, let me blow this up here. Gonna move on to Brian. Um, Brian, you wanna hop in and uh, share your screen, introduce yourself. Perfect. Gotcha. Uh, can everybody can you see the presentation here? Yep, you're all set. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. All 215 of you, it looks like, which is really awesome. Uh, my name is Brian Moore. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior data viz and analytics consultant at Clear Intelligence and one of the co-organizers of the Boston Tableau User Group. And I'm going to be talking about building interactive uh, business dashboards. So Tableau has some incredibly powerful tools for interacting with your data. And I'm going to be sharing some tips and tricks for leveraging those tools to design dashboards that are more flexible, uh, more engaging, more powerful, and really just a lot more fun to use. Uh, so this, uh, as Tim mentioned, this presentation is going to be really similar to one that I had done on VizConnect a few weeks ago. So if you happen to catch that one, feel free to just mute me for the next half an hour or so until Ken comes on. I swear I won't be, uh, won't be offended. Uh, so, all right, so raise your hand if you've ever been in a requirements meeting that looks something like this. So some of the stakeholders want a high level overview showing the overall state of the business. Others want a ton of detail, different cuts of the data to answer very specific questions. Now, I'm sure most of you didn't actually raise your hands because you're watching this at home by yourself. And that would be weird. But many of you probably encountered something similar. Uh, oftentimes what you end up with is just an absolute monstrosity, something that has 15 to 20 dashboards, it takes weeks or even months to build, and a short while later you find out that nobody is actually using it. Uh, it's too busy and complex for the people that wanted just a you know, high level overview, and for the people that wanted a lot of detail, the questions they were trying to answer a month ago aren't the same as the questions they're trying to answer now. So I'm a huge proponent of self-service analytics rather than building something um, that answers really specific questions that people have now. I'd rather build a tool that they can use to look up those answers and any other questions that might come up in the future. And that's kind of what this session is about. 
tips and tricks for building really flexible dashboards. All right, so here's a kind of basic KPI dashboard that we'll use for today's session. And we'll start with just a quick demo. So first off, we can filter the entire dashboard with these two bar charts over here. So you can click on a region to filter the dashboard, or you can filter on a subcategory. So using actions to filter your dashboard not only looks a lot nicer than quick filters, but it's better for performance and provides just a generally much more satisfying user experience for your users. Uh, there's several ways you can do this. You can do it with filter actions, parameter actions, set actions. I tend to use either parameters or sets just because they give you a little bit more flexibility in referencing those selected values. And the deciding factor is typically whether I want to be able to select one value or multiple values. Uh, you'll also notice that when I click on a mark, you don't get that weird kind of default highlighting that happens in Tableau. Instead, the other marks just kind of fade into the background. So I'll show you how to do that as well. All right, so this next section is kind of the meat of the presentation. So this is something that can really add some flexibility to your dashboards, and it's related to these bands up here. Uh, so Brandy touched on bands. We'll go with that big aggregated numbers. Thanks, Dustin. Um, so I like using these in my dashboards. You know, it gives just a quick prominent view of the metric totals. Uh, also used to like, or usually like to include some type of growth indicator for context. So here we have these little arrows with the percent growth from the previous period. Uh, what you can also do with these bands is use them to drive actions that can completely change your da dashboard and allow you to dive deep into each of the individual metrics. So right now we're viewing sales. If I click on profit, the entire dashboard is going to pivot. To look at profit, we can look at units sold, and so on. Uh, next we have these little arrows down here that will allow you to scroll through records in the view. So if you have a dimension that has a lot of values, displaying all of them with a scroll bar can really, really hurt performance, you know, especially if you have thousands of marks because Tableau has to render every one of those. Uh, so a pretty common practice is just to, to display the top n. So in this case, the top 10. But, you know, what if your users want to see the next 10 or the 10 after that or the 10 after that? So using these scroll buttons lets you view just 10 records at a time without hindering performance. Uh, personally, I think it just looks a lot nicer than a, than a scroll bar. Uh, and then finally, anytime you're building a dashboard with a lot of interactivity, it's important that your users know how to use it. So that's a huge barrier for adoption and one of the more common causes I've seen for low, uh, low usage on a dashboard. So training is important, but you might not always be available to train your users or answer questions. So that's why I like to include an overlay, uh, very similar to what Brandy just had in her dashboard. Um, I like to include these that just shows highlights each section of the dashboard that you can interact with and what happens when you interact with it. All right, so that's all I'm going to cover today. This is kind of a pretty common baseline model that I'd use for building a flexible dashboard. You know, it can support a lot of different users from different departments at various levels of the organization. But this is really just a jumping off point. There is just so much more that you could add to this to make it even more flexible and more powerful. Uh, but for now, we'll, we'll focus on what's here. I do have a lot to cover. We'll try to leave a couple minutes at the end for questions. But if we run out of time, feel free to reach out to me directly on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect and uh, to talk about these things. All right, so on to our first tip. So here we're going to filter the entire dashboard with a parameter action from this region worksheet. Uh, let me just get out of presentation mode here. Uh, you can see my the dashboard here, right? Normally there's a green circle around it showing that back. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go to the region worksheet. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is create a parameter for the region. I just call this region par. This is just going to be a string parameter, and I'm going to set the current value to all. Then we're going to create a calculated field for the filter. I'll call this region selected. And this is just going to say region that region parameter equals all, which means we want to display all, 
or that region parameter equals a specific region. I'm going to go back to my dashboard. I'm going to go to one of the worksheets that I want to filter. I'm going to drag that onto the filter shelf. I'm going to filter on just true values. Uh, and then I'm going to just right click on that, go to apply to worksheets, select all of the worksheets that I want to apply it to. In this case, it's pretty much every worksheet on my dashboard. And then in this specific case, I've also added it to context. You don't always need to do that. I just needed it for some other calculations in the dashboard. All right, so if I go back to my worksheet now, uh, so just just clicking on one of these marks here will now filter the dashboard, but there are still a, oh, no, I won't, sorry, <laughs> missed a step. So the next step is to create the parameter action to update that parameter. So I'm gonna go to dashboard, I'm gonna actions, I'm gonna add a parameter action. I'm gonna select just my region worksheet. So unfortunately there's no bulk select or deselect option with the actions, but what you can do is click on the top one, Hold shift, click on the bottom one, and then you can both deselect them. So now I'm going to select just my metric by region worksheet. I want to update the region parameter, and I want to pass my region value to it. So now when I click on a mark, it's going to filter the entire dashboard. Uh, so there's still a couple of issues here. First, we have that weird default highlighting that Tableau does. It's not terribly noticeable in this dashboard because it kind of fits the color scheme, but that's usually not the case. And look what happens when I click on this mark again. So now the default highlighting is gone. The filter is applied, but there's really no way to tell that a filter is applied um, other than knowing that these numbers look low or looking at the map. Uh, so with parameters, unlike set actions or filter actions, you can't just click again to remove a selection, but you can accomplish something really similar with another calculation. So I'm gonna go back to my worksheet and I create another calculated field called region remove. And this just says if the region that I click on is the region that's already selected, set that parameter back to all, otherwise set the parameter to that region. We'll bring that out to detail. I'm gonna edit our parameter action. And down here for the field, we're just gonna select that field instead. So now you can click once to apply a filter and then you can click on it again to remove that filter. All right, so we still have that weird default highlighting, so we're gonna address that next. So I'm gonna create a calculated field. I just call it HL for highlight. Typically, I just have a blank, uh, just a blank calculation here, but this could literally be anything. It means I love Tableau. I'm gonna drag that to the detail shell. Go back to my dashboard and I'm going to add a highlight action. Again, I'm going to deselect all of these and select. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong dashboard here. Let's try that again. I'm going to add a highlight action. I'm going to deselect all of these worksheets, select just my region one. Same thing under the target sheets. Then down here under target highlighting, I'm gonna click selected fields and select just my highlight field. Now what this does is it basically tricks Tableau. Uh, hold on one second. Oh, there we go. I forgot to select it there. So what this does is it basically tricks Tableau into highlighting every individual mark anytime you click on a mark. So you can see when we click on something, we can filter and we no longer have that weird default highlighting. Uh, but there's still a problem. Now you can't really tell which mark is selected without that default highlighting. And we can address that using color. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna take that region selected um, calculation that I built earlier drag that to color for my true value. So that's when either all is selected or an individual one is selected. I'm gonna have that kind of baseline blue. And for false, I'm gonna set it to the same color as the background in the dashboard, which to do that, I had just taken a screenshot and used a color selection tool to get the hex code. 
I double click and you can add the hex code directly into there. Get it exact. And now when you click on a mark, that mark will be blue and the rest of them will just kind of fade into the background. All right, so now on to the bands or the KPI selector. So there's kind of a lot to these, but we'll go through them step by step. So first we want to create a calculated field for each of our bands. So I'm on my sales band. I'm going to create a calculated field that's just called sales. And this is just going to be the word, word sales in quotation marks. I'm going to drag that to detail. Going to do the same thing on my next band. So for profit, I have one called profit. I'll drag that to detail. And you're going to want to do that for each of your bands individually. Uh, then we're going to create a parameter for our KPIs. I have this called metric select. Uh, this is going to be a string parameter. Now, for this, you can use all for the allowable values because we're always going to be passing a value to the parameter. The only reason I have this set to a list is because I wanted to alias some of these values um, after I had already built it. And this was a quick and kind of cheating way to do that. Uh, but if you are going to use a list, just make sure that these values align to whatever was in your other calculations for those bands. All right, then we're going to create a calculated field that represents whatever measure is being selected. So I have a calculation called metric calc. And this is just going to say when sales is select selected, then some sales, when profit, some profit, quantity, some quantity, and so on. And in each one of our worksheets in the dashboard, that's the metric that we're going to want to visualize. So here I have it on columns to create the, uh, the length of the bars. On area, I have it on rows to create the height of the area charts. Um, on this map, I have it on color and so on. Just that same calculation is going to be visualized in every one of my views. And then lastly, we're going to um, create a parameter action for each of our bands to take that kind of text calculation and pass it into the parameter. I'm going to go to dashboard actions and I add a parameter action. I'm going to select just my sales band. I want to update the metric select parameter with the word sales. I'm going to do the same thing for my profit band. The metric select with the word profit. And then you would do that for each of your bands individually. I'm just going to do these two just to save time. So right now everything is set to sales, but when I click on profit, the whole dashboard is going to pivot to view profit. Um, so the next step, um, when you click on a mark here, the whole band is going to turn blue, which again doesn't look terrible in this dashboard because it kind of fits with the color scheme, but in most cases it's not going to fit. So uh, in the previous tip, I had shown you a way to remove that default highlighting, but look what happens when I try to do it with these text marks. So if I add a highlight action, I'm going to select both of my bands, so profit and sales. So now it has the complete opposite effect of what we're looking for. And now the selected one turns blue and all of the other marks are going to get highlighted in yellow, which is not what we want. But there is another method that we can apply to uh, get rid of that. But first, I'm just going to get rid of my highlight action. All right, so we're going to create two calculated fields. Um, I have zero and one. Again, you can literally use anything, just this is what I learned doing it. So I just always tend to go to those. So zero is just going to be a zero. One is just going to be a one. I'm going to drag both of those to detail. I'm going to do that on each of my bands. I'm going to go back to my dashboard. I'm going to add a filter action. In the top one, I'm going to filter the view that's driving the action. So we'll start with sales. Under target sheets, rather than selecting it from the list here, we're actually going to select it from the drop down. So, in sales, we want to run the action on select. Under selected fields, we're going to add a filter. Under source, we'll choose zero. Under target, we'll choose one. 
And I'm going to do one more of those for a profit. Right. And select, selected fields, and zero and one. So this trick, rather than highlighting, like tricking Tableau and highlighting it, it's actually deselecting the mark after you click on it. Now you can see we no longer get that weird blue box. All right, so now we're still running into kind of the same issue we did in the last one, where you can't really tell what's, uh, what measure is selected. And again, we're going to address that with color. So I'm going to go to my sales worksheet. I'm going to create one more calculated field for each of my bands. It's just going to be a Boolean calc. So for sales, just going to say that metric parameter equals sales. Same thing for profit, quantity, et cetera. I'm going to drag that to color and then update the colors for the true and false values. So profit, I'm going to drag profit. So when these are true, I'm going to have them be blue. When they're false, I'm going to have them be gray. What you can also do with this is I'm going to take that same field and I'm going to control and drag it to text. Just going to do a little bit of formatting here. Um, let's see. So now when sales is selected, this is going to say viewing sales. When I click on something else, it's going to say click to view sales. And to do that, all I did was take the uh, Boolean calc, right click, go to aliases. I set the true value to viewing sales. So when sales is selected, that'll say viewing sales. That's how it'll display. When anything else is selected, it's going to say click to view sales. And then lastly, just going to go into each one of my headers. These are white fonts, you can't really see them, but at the beginning, I'm just going to insert my parameter. You can do that for all of them. So now when sales is selected, these will say sales by region, sales by subcategory. When profit is selected, those will all swap to say profit. All right, so now we have our KPI selectors in place, but there is another issue. So when we have the same measure here, we have this metric calc field on there. If we were to drag that to label, we can only select one format, but we have two currency measures, one that should be a whole number and one that's a percentage. Uh, so we want that to change dynamically. There's a couple ways to do that, but I'm gonna go over the way that kind of gives you the most control. So first we're gonna create a calculated field for each one of our measures. So I just have these called label. The label sales, it's just gonna say, if sales is selected, then return that metric count value. Otherwise, return null. That's gonna be the same for all four of these. Then for each of those, I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna to go to default properties, number format, and I'm gonna select the format that I want it to display with. So in this case, for sales, I want it to be currency, one decimal place, and I want it to display in thousands. Uh, for shipping, I want this to be a percentage to one decimal place, and I would do that for each of them. And I'm just going to shift and highlight all four of those, drag them out to label, click on label, and I'm going to bring these all up onto the same row without any spaces. So it looks like that, where they're just one next to each other. Okay, then I'll go back to my dashboard. And you can see when profit is selected, we have currency, when unit sold is selected, we have a whole number, and when odd time shipment is selected, we have a percentage. And you can re uh, just repeat that for all of the other views. You can also use that in the tooltips and anywhere else those values are used. All right, uh, one more thing to consider is whether or not the same chart type would be applicable for all of your different metrics. So in this case, an area chart is probably good for sales and profit, units sold, but maybe not this on-time shipment percentage one. Uh, so what you can do is use you know, some of the, leverage some of the work we have already done to um, sheet swap that to, an, to another view. 
So the first thing you want to do is create your two views. So here I have my area chart for the first three metrics. And here I have kind of a spark line chart for the, uh, the shipment. So I'm going to drag out a floating container. Uh, I'm just going to update the formatting on this because in all of these views, I have a white border and a white background set to 30% transparency just to get that kind of lighter blue. And I'm going to remove that from my worksheets. And I'm going to drag this worksheet into my container. Select the container and resize it. And I'm going to drag out my other worksheet into that container. And get rid of this new container. Uh, hide the title. All right, so now I have both of the views here. Now I just need to add a filter so it'll only display one of them depending on which is selected. So I'll go to my overtime shipping one. I'm going to create a, a calculated field called sheet swap filter. And this is just going to be a Boolean calc that says the metric select parameter is currently set to shipping. Drag that on the filter. And I'm going to filter it to just true values. Because the parameter is not currently set to shipping, you'll see there's no data presented here. I'm going to take that same field. I'm going to drag it onto filter. And I'm going to set that to false. Because that value is false, we'll see that data is presented here. Now, if you go back to your dashboard, anytime any of these are selected, that value is going to be false. And we're going to display this data or this view. Anytime this is selected, that value is going to be true. And it's going to swap the display just this view here. All right, now onto the scroll buttons. All right, so first I'm going to create just two new worksheets for a decrease and increase of the left and right buttons. For the left one, it's just going to be uh, set it to shape and do a left arrow. For the increase, it's going to be a shape set to a right arrow. I'm going to go to the one second. I'm going to go to the worksheet that I want to filter. Uh, first, I'm going to create a parameter. I call this lower range. It's just going to be an integer parameter currently set to one. Then I'm going to create a calculated field for the filter. I'll just call this range filter. So in this calculation, index is just representing the row. So this would have an index value of one, two, three, etc. This is saying, I'll show the parameter. So this is set to one. So this is saying that the index is greater than or equal to that lower value and less than that value plus 10. If you wanted to have 20 in your view, you could set this to 20. If you wanted it to be dynamic, you could use a parameter here instead. But I have this hard coded to 10. If I click OK and then drag that to filter, you can see we have just the top 10 records. I go to the next set of records and set this to 11. We have the next 10, 21. We have the next 10. Uh, but the problem here is each time you go to a new set of records, the, uh, the axis is recalculating, which we don't really want. We want everything to be related to that first record. And we don't want to fix the axis because we have that KPI selector. So that's always going to be changing. It can change depending on filters. Uh, we just want it to be related to our first record and nothing else. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. The way I like to do it is with a ref, uh, reference line. So I have this field called brain for ref line, which is just taking the window max of our metric calc field. I drag that to detail. I'm going to go to analytics, drag out a reference line onto the table. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the label, get rid of the tooltip, get rid of any of the lines. Now we have this Oh, where did it go? 
Oh, sorry, give me one second. Oh, yeah, I selected the wrong value. Uh, first, we want to make sure that we select our range ref line. Now we have it set there. Now we'll get rid of the label in the tooltip. I'm going to leave the line here. Normally, I would have the line, but just so we can see it when we shift to the next set of records, you can see that line stays there. So the axis remains pretty much fixed. I think there's another hidden line here somewhere that's throwing it off a little bit, but that's okay. All right. I'll get rid of the line. All right. So now the next step, um, we're going to start with this range decrease. So I need to create some calculated fields that we can use to update that range parameter. So when I click on the left arrow, I want to decrease the value by 10. When I click on the right arrow, I want to increase the value by 10. Uh, but I also want to make sure that the value doesn't go any lower than one. We don't want it to go negative because then it's not going to display any records. We also don't want it to go any higher than the number of values that we have in our dimension. Because um, basically you could just scroll to infinity without displaying any records once you reach that kind of upper limit. So we essentially want to turn off the arrows once they've reached either their upper or their lower limit. So I'm going to start with the previous arrow. Uh, so first, I'm going to create a calculated field that just tests to see if it's already at its lower limit, which in this case is one. And this is just going to search for it. This is just going to call it lower range limit, and it's just going to be a boolean count that says that lower range parameter equals one. I'm also going to drag that on the color. When it's true, I'm going to set it to something that's close to my background color just so it's barely visible, so you can kind of see that it probably doesn't do anything. And when it's false, I'm going to set it to a more accessible color. In this case, I picked gray, so it'll pop more in the background. And then we need one more calculated field that's going to uh, be the value that we're passing to the parameter. And this is called range decrease. And it's just going to say, if lower range limit, meaning if this is already set to one, keep it at one. Otherwise, subtract 10 from that range. And I'm going to drag that to detail. All right. For our increase button, it's almost the exact same. The only thing that changes is the calculation for that limit. So for the upper range limit, this is going to say if adding 10 to our parameter would be higher than the number of values we have in our dimension, um, and set it to true, meaning we don't want to be able to go any farther. Otherwise, set it to false. I'm going to drag that to color. Again, I'm going to set true to that dark blue and false to gray. And then for the parameter value, oh, that's the wrong one. It's going to say if we're already at our upper limit, then keep the parameter where it is. Otherwise, add 10 to it. I'll drag that into detail. And OK. Now, the last thing we need to do is just add a couple more parameter actions. I'm going to do first for my range decrease button. I want to update that low range parameter and I want to pass that range decrease value to it with no aggregation. And I want to do one more parameter for my increase button. I'm going to update the lower range and do my range increase with no aggregation. Now, every time we click that button, it's going to change that range and scroll through the records. One of the last thing that you'll want to do on this is you'll want to use that same trick that I had taught you in the last round to get rid of that default highlighting using the filter action. Uh, technically, you could use either of them, but if you were to use the highlight one, after you click once, that mark is going to stay selected. You'd have to click it again to deselect it and then click again to scroll using that second method it actually deselects for you, so you can just keep going. All right, um, so I think I am pretty much out of time. There, uh, there are a couple other tricks in here, including that kind of overlay that I had shown before. Um, if you can go to, uh, you can download this dashboard from Tableau Public, just search for my name, Brian Moore, and you'll see a dashboard that looks like this. 
And then on sonsofhierarchies.com, there's a very detailed blog post that walks through every one of these tips and uh, a, a few others that I didn't get to. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things you can do to make these dashboards more interactive, more flexible, more powerful, and just more awesome. And with all the options available today, you're literally only limit, limited by your creativity. And with this community, that is very, very rarely an issue. Awesome. Now I went through everything pretty quickly, um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And here's my person. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> Uh, go ahead and stop sharing if you would, Brian. Um, so next up, we're going to do uh, we're going to do our trivia. So I'm going to share that screen one second here. All right, should be able to see my screen now. All right, so for those of you not familiar with this, uh, Kahoot is a uh, trivia app or a trivia game we're going to play. Uh, Tableau specific questions. We're going to try to give away some uh, uh, Tableau swag here. We're going we're gonna to hammer through these pretty quick just for the sake of time. So what you'll need to do is from your phone, from your tablet, let me turn that down just a bit, from any device, um, go ahead and enter kahoot.it at the top right here this URL and then go ahead and put in this game pin and you can participate and uh, the swag will be uh, something from Tableau and uh, a Tableau course so pretty good we're gonna give folks a, a minute or so to, to jump in so the top three folks will uh, will get that swag just in reference and the uh, and a course on, uh, is it Udemy your course is on, Dustin? Yeah, you know, shameless promotion. Uh, yeah, I'll show that at the end after everybody's done, Perfect. so. Perfect. And uh, let's see. That's a lot of players. <laughs> That's a lot of players, yeah. All right, Jackie, are you still good to uh, yep. to handle the questions with me? Perfect. As soon as this stops, uh, as soon as this slows down here, we'll get started. Give everyone a chance to get in. Brian went to go jump in the kiddie pool after because he did that <laughs> presentation so fast. Can you all hear the music? Is that too loud or not loud enough? You can hear it. Sounds pretty good. Okay. Right. 104. 105. All right. I'm going to get started going once, going twice. All right. So eight questions, top three, we'll get some Tableau swag. Question one, where's Tableau Conference this year? So go ahead and hit that corresponding button on your device. Online virtual, Good. I'm glad y'all got that. We talked about that uh, at the beginning here, so I'm glad folks are paying attention. All right, Jackie, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you take the next one. All right. All right, look at the scoreboard real quick. Who won Iron Viz in 2019? It was a tie, absolutely. It was a tie. Nice. So, you know, based on the reception Mark Bradburn got, you could have, uh, that would have been a correct answer maybe as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
right, look at the scoreboard. All right, Lewis moving up. Kevin's up there. All right, which Tableau feature was not released in the last year? So we're looking at version 2019.2 through 2020.2. Get it in quick, four seconds. Set actions, yeah. So I knew this one would would trip folks up. Set actions, I believe, was 2018.3. Uh, so that was a ways back. It doesn't feel like that long ago. All right. Next question. Kevin at the top, of course. <laughs> Juno and Christina. All right. Question number four. Which of the following authors of the Big Book of Dashboards was not a Zen master? Andy was not a Zen master. Absolutely. Andy is, uh, I believe, technical evangelist. Is that his title for Tableau? I believe so, yeah. All right. Karna and Juno still up there. Kevin's still up there. Christina. Question five. First, last, and index are all examples of. So if you're watching Brian's presentation, you should be able to get this one. Table calcs, that's right. All examples of table calculations. <laughs> Streak of five for Kevin. Yeah. In the leaderboard. Viz animations can be found in which menu? Format. Format. Yeah, it's a tough one. So not a lot of folks maybe have upgraded yet or, or have his animations. It's in the format menu. All right. John Whitmer taking them up the lead with that one. Which of the following is not a Tableau e-learning path? So for those of you that are interested, uh, you got a couple more days to sneak in, get that free 90 days. It is data engineer, data engineer. So I think through the end of the month, they're still offering that uh, free 90 days for e-learning. All right. Question number eight, last one. The noodle is the nickname for Tableau's new <laughs> That's right. Tableau's <laughs> new data model functionality. Yeah. Not a dance move, not a water slide. Perfect. So let's see the let's see what we got for the leaderboard. Karna. Nice. And of course. Kevin, I am curious on which one Kevin, which, oh, well, both of you got one wrong. I'm curious on which one that was. So top three folks, uh, send us your contact info. We will uh, we'll get some Tableau swag out to you. Uh, so email or, or messaging. Any of the panelists here, we should take yep, care. Yep, uh, Dustin posted in the chat his email address to send him your shirt size and uh, address so we can get you your swag. Yeah. Perfect. Hey, uh, Tim, can I share my screen for a sec? Absolutely. Yeah, let me uh, grab this here. Stop sharing my screen. Super quick. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys don't want, like, a T-shirt, that's cool. If you find something, like, reasonably priced, just let me know uh, from the Tableau store. Uh, also, you will be getting, and I don't think Kevin needs this at all, but a free copy of the Up and Running with Tableau Desktop on Udemy, uh, which you know is quality because it was produced in my coronavirus basement under the stairs like Harry Potter. So that's, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, next up, let me share my screen again. Let's see. Next up, we have Ken. Um, for those of you that don't know Ken, 
where have you been? Have you been under a rock? Um, Ken is a Zen master and uh, one half of the Fleur Lodge brothers. Um, so I'll let him kind of introduce himself and uh, take it away. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, let me stop sharing here. All right, everybody see my screen here then? Yep, you're all set. Get all this stuff out of the way here. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, that last uh, quiz question was a great lead in to my presentation here. I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the new data model a little bit here. Uh, so before we, before we do that, uh, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ken Flerledge, I'm Assistant Director of Data Analytics at Bucknell University. I'm a three-time Zen master. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Tim mentioned, I'm a, a twin brother with, with Kevin, who is also a Zen master, and we share this website here, FleurLegeTwins.com. Um, and you can find my Twitter handle here as well, uh, and I'll share some additional contact information at the end. Uh, and just, just a quick sort of picture of some of my, my public work. So if you want to see any of the other work I've done, you can just check out um, my Tableau public page and, and see a little bit more of this. But today we're going to talk about the uh, the new data model. And so I've written a blog on this. Here's the link for the blog. I would just ask everybody. There's really no reason to uh, take notes or anything like that. Every this is going to be recorded, so you can revisit the recording, and you can certainly uh, go read the blog as well. So put down your notepads and put down your pens and just listen and and kind of take in some of this inf this information about the new data model. All right, sound good. So in order to understand the new data model, we have to first understand the old data model, right? So this is the, the old data model was prior to the current version, prior to 2020.2, and it's pretty much the way it's been for, for many, many years. And so we're all should, you know, as Tableau users are all pretty familiar with this, this sort of setup and, and setting up a join, those kinds of things in, in Tableau. So, what you do is you bring your tables over. You, if you have multiple tables, then you get this little Venn diagram and you have to select the type of join and how they're joining, right? So we've all been dealing with this for, for many years and we're all very familiar with this. Now the thing about this data model and the way it worked is um, it was sort of set it and forget it. You establish this data model and it uses that sort of base data model for everything it's doing throughout Tableau. And um, unfortunately, I'm gonna have, you know, in order to really understand what's going on, we're gonna have to think about a little bit of, of structured, structured query language. Um, ultimately, SQL, SQL, that's, it, that's the language that Tableau is using to communicate to the database. So in order to understand the differences between the old and new, we really kind of need to take a look at under the covers and, and look at the SQL. So we're try we won't get too complicated with the SQL. So if you're not a SQL person, don't worry about it, but it's, we're just gonna do some basic stuff so you can see um, how the two, two differ. So with this data model, it's gonna establish this, this basic SQL that looks something like this. We're selecting from orders, we're performing an inner join to the people table, and we're performing that join on this region field. And we've, you know, that's just exactly what we've defined here in our data model, right? So this is gonna become sort of the base SQL that's used no matter what we build in Tableau. And we'll take a look at a couple of additional uh, examples here in a moment. So let's, let's take this data and let's create a simple bar chart, right? So we have customer, uh, customer name and we have sum of sales. The thing I wanna point out is that both customer name and sales come from the orders table. We're not using anything from the people table in this view at all. And yet, when we look at the SQL of what's happening here, we see it selecting customer name and sales from orders and still performing that inner join to people on the region. Again, as I said, that's the way the old data model works. It's set that sort of standard SQL and then it uses it throughout the views, no matter, no matter what's on the view and what's not on the view. Um, I should note there are some, some some flags that you can uh, switch in, in the old uh, older versions that allow you to do, uh, to eliminate some of these, but generally speaking, this is how it works. So 
that's really one sort of key problem or key, one key flaw with the old data model is we get these unnecessary joins in, in some situations. We don't need people, and yet it's in, including that here. So uh, we'll just we'll just remind uh, think of that and, and put that put that away for the moment, and let's move on to some uh, some other sort of flaws in, in the old data model. So what we've been using so far is this simple people table. Uh, I think we're all, you know, anyone who's used Superstore is pretty familiar with this. Um, basically has one person per region, right? But what if we had a situation like this? So this is my people multiple table. And you can see here for each region, I have multiple salespeople. So what happens when we join this to the orders with the old data model? Well, that model is going to look pretty much the same as the other one. We've got orders and people multiple, and we're are setting uh, the join and inner join on region. And the sequel looks like this. So this is pretty pretty similar to what we saw with the people table, right? Now let's go. Um, sorry, um, but but the key problem with this is that since we have multiple multiple people in our people multiple table, when you perform that join, you duplicate your record. So this first bar shows the join to the regular people table, and we have about 10,000 records. But when we join to that multiple people table, it doubles our record count. There's one, there's, there's two people for each region, so essentially it, it multiplies those records by two, and we end up with about 20,000 records. And what do we end up having to do, right? We have to be aware of this, we have to know this, and then we end up generally using LODs to, to, to eliminate those duplicate records. Of course, there are other techniques that you can use. You can do things with blending, or you could do things with um, table calculations and, and different things like that to, to eliminate that impact. But we have to be aware of this, and we have to know that this is happening, and we have to find, you know, we have to implement some sort of technique to, to address that. So ultimately, with the old data model, we end up with, with sort of three key disadvantages. One is we get those unnecessary joins, and when you have too many of those unnecessary joins, you can really start to have a performance impact on, on, your, on your viz. So, you know, if we can avoid those, those unnecessary joins, then, then we would get better performance. Uh, we also have this possibility of duplicate records, and it's something we have to be very aware of and, and really know our data and understand uh, our data. And then, of course, if we do get those duplicate records, we end up having to do something with LODs or some other technique to, to limit the impact of those. And I think, you know, we've all been in this situation, probably all been in a situation where we've ended up with those duplicate records and didn't realize it. And particularly when we were new to Tableau, we might not have realized that. We might have just aggregated the number and ended up double or triple counting our, our, our numbers by doing that. So if we can avoid that, um, we'd all be much better off. And particularly, I think new users um, would be much better off in that type of environment. So I think you can probably see where I'm going with this. Uh, the good news is the new data model addresses a lot of these issues here. So let's take a look at the new data model. Uh, the new data model is the new, the new guy on the block. Uh, it's, 20, it's introduced in 2020.2, which is the current release. And uh, it looks something like this. So it looks similar to the old data model, uh, but slightly different. And so we'll talk about some of the uh, some of the different components of this. So first of all, you know our quiz question: the noodle. We see this little noodle between the two tables here. Uh, we don't have that Venn diagram anymore because we're not actually doing a join at all. We're just sort of creating this this loose tie, this loose relationship between. Uh, those two tables based on these relationships that we've specified here. Relationships can just like just like join fields, they can there can be multiple fields. Um, in this case, I've just done a single set of fields, just uh, region and region on, on both sides, right? Now, another piece of terminology we need to be aware of is this uh, is called a logical model, and these are called logical tables. And they're called logical because there's actually another layer below this. So if I were to double click on orders, it's going to take me down a level to the physical layer and physical tables. So this is pretty much the old data model, right? That old data model still sort of exists within Tableau, but you can, you can build these physical models, which then create these logical models, and then you can 
relate the logical models together. Um, now, at first, I think, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, this is going to be a little bit confusing, you know, which, which layer do I work with? And, and, and I think, um, you know, it just takes some time for people to get used to that and comfortable with that. I think long term and hopefully what we see is that uh, people get to the point where almost all of their data modeling within Tableau is, is using those logical models and, and letting Tableau do the rest of the work for us. But there are times when you want to get to that physical layer, so it's still there and it's important to know that it's still there under the covers. All right, so let's go back and look at our model. So this model is pretty similar to what we did with the old data model brought in orders, we brought in people. Instead of joining on region, we've set this relationship between the two, right? And if we go and create a, a bar chart, a similar bar chart to what we did before, something like this, um, we, we, can, you know, we get the exact same results as we did with, with the join. Um, now, one thing I wanna point out here is you'll notice here on the left that things look a little bit different. Uh, Dimensions and measures historically have been separated and grouped together. So all the dimensions, regardless of what table, and all the measures, regardless of what table, have been grouped together. Uh, by default, you'll get dimensions and measures together and grouped by the logical table. So you'll see two separate group. In this case, we would see two separate groups of dimensions and measures for each of those logical tables. And you can still turn on folder-based grouping and, and rearrange things how you like. All right, so back to our bar chart. Now you'll remember before that uh, these two fields only come from the orders table. There's, there's nothing being used from people here. So let's take a look at what, what the SQL, what happens with the SQL in this case with the new data model. So in this case, we do select customer name and sales from orders and group by customer name. Let's compare that to the old one. So the old one, remember that we had this, the, this join to the people table. In the new one, we no longer have that. So what Tableau has done is it's realized that people isn't being used in this view anywhere, and it's, it's removed that join. This is a process called join culling. It's just culled that join because it doesn't need it. People is not necessary. So it's created this much more performant uh, query that eliminates those unnecessary, uh, those unnecessary joins. But what if we then add uh, something from the person from the people table? So we've added person as a filter. So this view now needs uh, something from the people table for it to work. So the SQL in this case ends up looking something like this. So we've still got the same uh, stuff from orders, and we're still grouping on customer name. But we've whoop, but we've reinserted this this join to the people table and done the water clause on, on that particular person. So what Tableau is doing here is it's, it's instead of just using that sort of core base model that we set up in our physical layer, it's doing what I would refer to as it's generating smart SQL, right? It's understanding the, the nature of our data. It's understanding what we've, what tills we've placed on rows and columns and filters and, and the marks card and it's generating SQL that is specific to that particular use case and, trying, and tries to eliminate all those additional redundancies and problematic types of, uh, of, of SQL components that we don't really need anymore. All right, so, so far we've just been doing the simple people table, right? That has one person per region. But what if we now add uh, the people multiple table. So we're going to wipe out the people table. We're going to add in people multiple. And we know this has this problem with multiple, with multiple records per people. Before in the old data model, that led to data duplication. So let's take a look at what happens in the new data model. So our SQL now looks something like this. And this is significant, significantly more complex than the SQL we've, we've looked at so far. Um, and and um, you know, we won't go through this in detail, um, but some core pieces of this are still pretty much the same. The select customer name from orders uh, and the group by, but the key part that's different is this, this uh, select statement, this sub-select statement. And basically what this is doing is it's, it's taking the filter and then finding a way to return back just a single value for a region and by by returning a single value for region, when we perform that join, we won't get record duplication. 
So when we look at record counts, we now see something more like this. So with the people, with the people, it's up with the people relationship, not join, but with the people table, we had about 10,000 records. Now with people multiple, because of that smart SQL that it's generated, it's still only created about 10,000 records. So we've er eliminated that issue of, of creating duplicate records and the need to then find different techniques to, to deal with it, which is really nice and is really gonna make, I think our lives as analysts a lot easier. And while I'm here, I wanna point out one thing. Uh, we no longer have the number of records field that's gone it's been replaced by these counts per logical table like this. Um, I think the reason largely for that is that there is no singular number of region or number of records. It all depends on the SQL that's, that's being generated uh, and that number could vary quite a bit. So we get these individual counts per, per logical table instead and they act and work similarly to number of records in the way that that's worked in the past. So let's return back to our old model disadvantages and, and review these quickly. So one of the biggest issues, as we said, was those unnecessary joins and the performance impact. As we can see, Tableau with the new data model does a really good job of eliminating those unnecessary joins only using the tables that it actually needs. So we've eliminated that issue. Uh, the duplicate record issue, well, as we've just seen, the, the, this, you know, the intelligence built into the new data model uh, just for that, it understands our data and is able to, to eliminate those problems. And because we've eliminated those duplicate records, uh, we no longer really need to use level of detail calculations to, to address that problem. So all three of our key issues have, have been addressed. So some key, some key advantages of the new data model. So if we just sort of pick up Take a look at this from a higher level. Obviously, get some advantages are the three things that we just mentioned um, that are much better with, with the new data model than the old data model. But generally speaking, uh, this is going to be a lot easier to use. Um, if you do think about new users who may not be aware of LODs and you know the possible you know multi one to many relationships and, and the, the problems that can come up with that. Um, this is this is going to be much easier for them to just pull those in and, and, and not worry about the join types and those types of things. Um, also, better accuracy again for those new users who who aren't aware of how to you know those 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 potential issues with duplicate records. Um, it's very likely that those people could find themselves uh, over-reporting their numbers uh, with the old data model. So the new data model helps to eliminate that problem, and they don't have to worry about getting into some complex um, types of calculations to deal with it. And then finally, it really, I think, will increase the number of use cases for a single data source. Uh, I know I personally sometimes find myself having to build multiple data sources from the same set of tables to deal with um, very specific kind of use cases or scenarios. So I think with the new data model and the intelligence that's built into it, we should see that we can start to um, bring together and consolidate some of these data sources into a single data source and then allow Tableau to use its smart SQL uh, to, to build the data uh, based on how we've, how we've um, created our view, right? So I think, that's, uh, I think that's something that we'll see over time as, as this develops. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a really a move in the right direction and is really gonna make our lives easier uh, as Tableau users and developers. Um, I do wanna note that there are a few limitations currently so right now, relationships are equality only. You can't do no, no, uh, inequality relationships. So greater than or equal to, greater, uh, you know, less than, not equal to, those things aren't available today uh, in relationships. And if, you, uh, if you're on 2020.2 and you need to do those types of things, then you're probably going to need to go back to the physical, uh, physical layer to, to set those up. Uh, there are no relationship calculations. So uh, if you, you know, you, many of you have probably used join calculations in the past. Uh, we don't have that sort of thing within relationships uh, currently. And then there are certain types of, of data warehousing methodologies that aren't supported with the new data model yet. I uh, won't go into detail on that, uh, but if you check out my blog, the links at the top take you to a lot of the, uh, the Tableau documentation and they go into detail on some of those things that you need to be 
wary of. But um, this is really just version one, right? This is just the start of this new feature. This is what Tableau is going to be basing everything on moving forward. So I think we should expect um, and will expect to see continued improvements and this just continuing to get better over time. And in fact, um, you know, I built this slide deck uh, a couple of weeks ago and I had to go back just recently and add this new slide in here because they just announced the 20, uh, 2020.3 beta. And if you, if you take a look at this, you'll see that they, they're making some significant improvements to the, the two relationships. And two that I'll particularly point out are custom calculated fields. So we'll now have those, those uh, relationship calculations, just like we had with join calculations, and we have inequality operators. So we'll be able to do less than or greater than or not equal to. So those are uh, yet another thing that's going to take this closer and closer to being a full-fledged um, feature that we can use and continue to build on and hopefully get to the point where we never really have to even have to worry about the physical layer. We can just focus on building these logical models and then get to the real work of, within Tableau of analyzing our data and visualizing our data. And with that, that's all I have for you. Here's uh, just another quick uh, picture of the, the blog URL if you want to check that out. And then all my contact information is here. Um, I don't know. Do we have do we have time for questions at all? Uh, yeah, let's let's hit a couple of these questions. I think Ken, because some of them uh, I think would be beneficial for the for the greater group to know. <clears throat> okay. Um, the first one. Uh, can you see the the SQL that Tableau creates? Um. Yes, but it's not really that easy. It's not made that easy. So you can you can. You can see the SQL in a couple of different ways. Um, you can turn on performance recorder and it records the SQL within those logs. Um, my personal method generally is, is I'm a former DBA. So uh, when I do it, I typically run a trace on, on the database, but those are, those are complicated uh, things to do, uh, unfortunately. So it's, they're not, they're, it's not really all that easy to see the SQL. Um, and who knows, maybe over time, that will become a, an easier thing to, to get to. Um, another one that we have here <clears throat> is about kind of a backwards compatibility. Uh, if your server is say on version 2019 point anything, um, will the TWBs be downgraded? How, how does it work when it's published? Have you had a chance to test that at all? So if you publish, um, if you say you pub, if you open up something in 2020.2, and publish to an older version of a server. That's right. Um, I, I haven't tried that, but what what happens if you open? Um, let me show you what. If you open a, let me share my screen again. If you open a workbook. So the Superstore, for example, they haven't, they haven't changed this yet, but if you open this in 2020.2, it's still using the old data model. And what you'll see is something like this, this migrated data. Mm -hmm. It basically just takes your, your old physical data model and crams it into one single uh, you know, a logical data model. And then if you double click on that, you can see all your views. So I think they've done a pretty good job of making these backwards compatible, um, but just be aware of, you know, if you, if you open it up and you see something like this, that means your physical model is in there and you can get there and edit it. And I, I do believe that it does a pretty good job of being backwards compatible when you, when you, uh, when you deploy things to server. Okay. And someone just mentioned in the chat, it does give a prompt. Um, uh, yeah, Tableau Server's always done that, right? If you if you uh, if you have a newer version of desktop and you're and you're publishing to server, it, it's always giving you a prompt. Um, my recommendation is, you know, is generally you know try to keep your desktop version on the same version as as server, um, because you're just going to run into little headaches here and there. There are there are features that you might not even know you're using, right? That 
that you've used and it's become a critical part of your workbook. And then you go to publish and you realize that, um, you know, those features aren't available to you. So I think it's really important to, to try to stick with the, the same version as your server. Um, and if you're getting too behind, you have to start, uh, start getting on your server admin to, to get upgraded. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, thanks for taking the time uh, out of your day to come hang out with us a little bit, share, uh, share your blog. Um, I think that'll be very useful, but uh, the new data model is sort of a big change for folks. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it works uh, going forward. Yep, yep, definitely. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, so we have uh, one more. Uh, Kate, are you there? I am. Perfect. Um, so Kate, uh, you have a competition to announce, is that right? I do. It's more of a challenge than a competition, uh -huh. and, um, and it's not going to be limited um, to just Boston. So anyone who's on the call or anyone in the community is more than welcome to participate. Um, and I, I do say that it, it's not a contest and more of a challenge um, because what we want to do is highlight the Black Heritage Trail in Boston, uh, which is a 1.6 mile walk through the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston. And there are tours that are run. Um, obviously right now there are no walking tours for this uh, because of COVID. But what we thought would be a great opportunity is for the community to really um, delve into some of the history of uh, black, um, black community members in Boston and really understand um, some of the history in Boston for that community. So there is an existing trail um, and the first stop is the Robert Gould Shaw and the 54th Regiment uh, Memorial. So if you saw the more movie Glory, that was about the 54th Regiment um, from Massachusetts. And the trail goes through um, 10 different stops and the data site you'll see is in here does have the latitude and longitude for it. But these are not just points on a map. Um, there's a history and story behind all of these points that are definitely connected to where we are today in society, not just in Boston, um, but specifically these sites were in Boston. So there's information about it um, on the Museum of African American History. I've put the links in here. This um, Tableau workbook is on my it is on my um, public page and what I can do is when I get back to the chat, I don't think that I can access the chat from here. Can I? Uh, chat. See if that comes up. Here, what I'm going to do is I'll just throw this text file up and then we can make sure that everyone gets the link. That will take you uh, right to uh, the workbook and you can download the workbook. So you know, as I said, the data set's incredibly small. We don't want you to look at this as just places on a map. We want you to research the trail, read the history, understand the history, and share that knowledge. Um, the rules or kind of guidelines for this are, um, you have to use Tableau. It's gotta be saved to Tableau Public and made downloadable. You can supplement and we encourage you to supplement the data with additional information that you found. Um, you can download this workbook or export the last tab to get the uh, sites for the data set. Make sure that you cite your sources. Uh, the ones that I, are, I use to generate the data set are listed below. If you use anything else, be sure to cite that. Uh, the challenge will run from today through July 17th. And there's a Google form um, that just asks for your name, your email address, and a link to your viz. Um, and feel free to share the viz on Twitter and be sure to tag at Boston Tug if you do that. So I tried to fit that in really quick because I know we're kind of over time. Um, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, and we'll make sure to publish out that link. Um, and you can also look for me, Kate Brown, on Tableau Public. And that's all I got, Tim. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> all right. So that's uh, all we have for you all today. Um, I'm going to share my screen one last time. Uh, you can follow us on social media. If you're on Twitter, if you're on uh, LinkedIn, uh, feel free to join us there at Boston Tug or NTX Tug. Um, of course, all the panelists, all the user group leaders are on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and Tableau Public as well. Um, 
I just want to say thanks um, for joining us today. I hope you learned something. I hope it was fun. Uh, does anybody else want to add uh, something before we go? Any of the panelists? Uh, I just want to say thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yes, thanks thanks for joining us and thank you, Ken, for presenting and Brian. Absolutely. Thank you. And it was fun meeting everyone from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Great to meet y'all as well. All right, thanks everyone and uh, have a great weekend. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks.